John Batchelor, Gordon Chang of Forbes.com is here. The music is Empire, Total War. Nick Malone's got that picked out because we're going to the East China Sea one more time. The East China Sea, there is a zone over a large portion of the East China Sea created by the PLA Navy within these last days. And that zone conflicts with the Japanese air defense zone and the Korean air defense zone. The U.S. sent two B-52s through it in these last hours. This is a contest between superpowers. It is also a mystery to be solved for commercial aircraft. And we're joined now by Michael Alston of the American Enterprise Institute, who help, can help us understand what is to be done and what is being said in Washington right now about this conflict zone over the uninhabited Senkaku Islands and a vast piece of the East China Sea. Michael, a very good evening to you. What about the commercial aircraft? What, what have you learned? Good evening, John. Well, what I've heard from uh, sources in the U.S. government is that essentially Washington is telling American commercial air carriers, you're on your own, meaning uh, it is up to them, in the words I was told, it's up to them to decide whether or not to provide the Chinese with the identification information they're demanding. Uh, this, I think, is, is deeply concerning. Uh, you would really hope that the U.S. government would tell United and American and Delta, no way, don't give them that information and, and we'll be there to back you up. But in Instead, they're actually saying uh, it's up to you. And then if you heard the State Department spokeswoman, Jen Psaki, this afternoon, she said that Washington is trying to figure out if this so-called air defense identification zone uh, is, uh, uh, is something for commercial carriers as well as military. So basically, Washington's been caught flat-footed. It, it's just stunning to me. Well, Michael, of course, the contrast is with Tokyo, which has told its two largest carriers not to comply with Chinese demands um, for identification of their aircraft when they enter the air defense identification zone that Beijing has established. So it's a very different attitude in Tokyo than in Washington, apparently. Yeah, well, Gordon, I, I think with the conflicting news, though, that I'm, I'm also hearing, and at least early reports were, is that the Japanese carriers immediately said that they would provide that information. And I think that Abe is, you know, sees this as part of a much larger political challenge, and therefore they're trying to get those carriers to, to backtrack and say, no, you know, don't give them the information. On the other hand, I mean, let's, let's be honest, if you're, if you're a commercial air carrier, at this point in time, for all you know, the lives of the thousands of passengers who ride in your airplanes rest in the hands of 25-year-old Chinese fighter pilots. And, uh, you know, it is the prudent thing to do at this point to say we're going to give this information if your governments are not going to back you up. And the only way to do that is for there to be a serious show of force that shows the Chinese that they're not going to be able to get away with this. But, uh, you know, I hate to say it, I'm very glad we flew the two B-52s. We have phenomenal Pacific Air Forces out there under the command of General Herbert Carlyle. Uh, but quite frankly, from, you know, from the Washington perspective, that's not enough. Washington has to make a clear policy that we're going to be flying regularly and in force. September 1st, 1983 is the date you're all trying to recall. That's KAL 007. That was the incident that came very close to triggering a whole lot of really ugly decisions in Washington and Moscow. That was then. This is now. The Cold War is over. Or is it? I want to go to the sea forces because in addition, Michael, we've learned in these last hours that... China's PLA Navy has sortied, deployed, just sort of coincidentally sent its newly built, renovated aircraft carrier without planes, without an air wing, through the East China Sea to the South China Sea. This looks like more naked provocation. Is it or coincidence, Michael? Well, I, you know, I actually probably come down on the line that it, it is more coincidence in the sense of uh, if they don't have an operation planned, uh, you know, these are things that are happening at the same time. I don't think it's a coincidence that you see them pushing in both the East and South China Seas. But the, the message being sent is clear. And, and what you heard from the Chinese when they set up this air defense zone, which I think we should be honest, we should call it an air control zone, because that's what they're trying to do, um, is that this was only the first one. And once they got this one up and running, meaning if it would be successful, they're going to do others. And that means one thing only. That means the South China Sea. Because if, if you've succeeded in intimidating Japan and South Korea and much larger nations, what hope is there for the smaller Asian nations? So 
sending the aircraft carrier and elements of the PLA fleet back down into the South China Sea, where they've already been transiting, combining it with what's going on up north, the message is very clear. And, John, we could be sitting here next Thanksgiving, and quite frankly, all of East Asia could be under a new regime of Chinese sufferance for traveling through the air routes. Well, I guess that's possible, Michael, but I actually think that it's very unlikely that the Japanese will back down. Also, even the South Koreans who have been trying to build bridges to Beijing have uh, made it very clear that they're not going to back down either. The United States has said that it's going to conduct regularly military exercises in the zone, and it's not going to honor Beijing's requirements. So I think that essentially what we're going to see is China uh, very much at a point where they're going to have to decide to escalate. And then the issue I guess, and the question for you is, what are we going to do after the Chinese don't let us have the last word on this? Yeah, I mean, Gordon, I I think your analysis is spot on, and uh, there's no question that they overreached. The one thing that, to to step back one one bit, uh, I I would be looking, and I think we should all be trying to find out, uh, just how are we changing, if at all, the way that that we do fly or we were planning on flying uh, on the military side? Because it is one thing to say we're not going to respect it, but there is another way in in which you can operate so as you so as to reduce tensions. And you know, we've seen that with the Americans before. They really Really try to not rile up the Chinese. Whether this time will be different or not, uh, we'll see. But given what happened in 2001 in March with the EP3 incident, uh, in terms of your question, if they don't let us have the last word and they don't back down, uh, we need to be to be very aware that there are a lot of hotshot pilots out there who haven't had a lot of great training, who haven't dealt with crisis situations, and we will need to be very ready uh, to protect ourselves, you know, the lives of our, our military pilots, and quite possibly a civilian airliner that doesn't get the word and, and, and doesn't play by China's rules. Yeah, and the interesting thing is that if you look at China's flag officer corps, um, there are very, very few of them who have had any experience in war. The only real war experience that Chinese um, soldiers and pilots and and sailors have had, of course, is 1979 with the limited invasion of Vietnam. Almost all of those people who took part in that have now left the Chinese military. So you're dealing with very nationalistic, um, very aggressive, very arrogant officers who have no experience of actually fighting a war, therefore are not horrified by it. The fi- the final sentence, gentlemen, just a moment, the final sentence from Secretary of Defense Hagel on a statement on the November 23rd was, the United States reaffirms its long-standing policy that Article 5 of the U.S.-Japan Mutual Defense Treaty applies to the Senkaku Islands. Michael, that's in English. Is it too late? Uh, I don't think it's too late. I, I do think we've gone way farther down the road than we needed to. And quite frankly, we haven't had a statement quite as strong as that for a while from Washington. So I, I'm glad it's out there. But again, this is an administration that is known for its words, not for its actions. And everyone in Asia has been watching for five years now as the actions have not met the rhetoric. So uh, Secretary of Defense Hagel can say what he wants. I'm glad he said it. But we will have to show that there is going to be absolutely no hesitation on our part to get our planes up in the air to escort planes if we need uh, and in no way to be to have the type of ambiguity that was coming out of Washington this afternoon saying well we don't know if this applies to commercial as well as military Michael Auslin of the American Enterprise Institute Gordon Chang of Forbes.com I'm John Batchelor